This week's video is an interview that I had with the IL-2 Great Battles team. Based on what I could find, it seemed like the IL-2 Great Battle team has not done a sit down with anyone for the last two years. And based on the reaction from my DCS module maker interviews, I thought it'd be good to sit down with the IL-2 Great Battles team to go over some of the questions that the community has wondered about and to help cut through the noise. In this sit down, we discussed the business model of IL-2 Great Battles. We went into the engine and its capacity the Pacific, four engine bombers, some hints into the next great battle, as well as some other topics. I have made sure to add chapters to the video so you can pop around to the section that you want. Lastly, if this is your first time here, this channel focuses on multiplayer sim gameplay. So if you're into that, please subscribe. Good day, and um, I have Anatoly, Han, and also Andre from the IL-2 Great Battles team. Um, I thought it'd be good to start with intro. If you think about it, um, a lot of the players just go on Steam or on the IL-2 Great Battle Store and they and they download the game, but they may not know everyone who's involved. Uh, so I thought it'd be good for everyone to kind of get to hear your guys' voice and, and to understand like where your perspective and where you're coming from. So um, let's start with Andre. Uh, could you give a quick introduction of who you are and kind of how long you've been involved with IL-2 Great Battles? Hi, everybody. I'm working uh, on IL-2 Great Battles since, I think, the end of uh, 2013, when we were working on Stalingrad. Uh, currently, I am I fill a couple of roles in the, on the team. I'm data manager, localization manager, and so on. Perfect. Uh, Han? Yes, hello. Could you give a quick intro of like your involvement with the team and uh, just so the players know like what perspective you're kind of coming from? Oh, I came I came to simulation development uh, in uh, 2004, 2004. And uh, I have started from uh, another company and I have uh, moved to this company, uh, let's say 14 years ago. So I'm with this uh, uh, team already for 14 years. I have started from QA manager. Uh, I have passed the uh, project manager role. And now I technical producer of a project. OK, perfect. Thank you. And then uh, Anatoly, uh, your background and your kind of your involvement with the, with the project would be helpful. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anatoly Subotin. I'm actually, I've joined the team. Uh, I kind of rejoined the team only in August this year. I've been working at 1C and um, at the previous generation of IL-2 Sturmovic until 2014. Uh, and I've spent around 12 years uh, with the team by that time. It was another team and another project, actually. It was IL-2 Sturmovic, the first generation. Then I left the gaming industry in 2014 and came back this August. And um, I'm currently the marketing director at Bonsi Game Studios. Technical backgrounds here, and we have marketing backgrounds, so uh, a, a good different mix of perspectives. Uh, one thing that I find really interesting is games don't live in a silo. And what I mean by that, um, you know, games don't stand on their own. There, there's a lot of different options that people have. Um, and when we look at the flight simulators across the market, uh, we see that things are basically kind of priced out at a cost per module basis. For example, War Thunder has a cost of around $60 at release. And this you know, may also include like a week of premium. And in DCS, modules cost anywhere from $60 to $80, while maps uh, cost money in that game. And on the flip side, IL-2 Great Battles has a totally unique business model that really stands at odds with those games. It has more fidelity than War Thunder, but less clickable f fidelity than DCS. But it's, but it's priced not per module, but per pack or per battle. And if we, if we were to take the $80 cost of IL-2 Battle of Normandy, which contains 10 aircraft, we see that the cost per plane is not $60 or $80, but actually $8 per plane. And that's not counting the map, which comes with the pack. So my... I think this context is important and sort of what I wanted to ask is how does IL-2 Great Battles do it um, and why is this pricing so competitive relative to the rest of the market and just kind of what your guys' reaction is to to how IL-2 sits in the market compared to everyone else. Well, we were always aiming to offer an all-in-one all integral product uh, that tries to re represent a certain battle 
meaning it has to have a map and a career mode and so on, not just uh, aircraft. Uh, of course, there is very fine balance between the pricing and staying profitable to fund first development. And so far, we thankfully we were able to keep it. Uh, however, some people still complain uh, that um, our models cost too much. I guess it all depends on how much uh, you value uh, the stuff we offer, how much you value the strong points of our sim, uh, how much you are into World War II uh, fighters and other air aircraft. Also, free-to-play games uh, give the player an illusion that uh, almost everything uh, can be had for nothing uh, if you spend enough time on this, but uh, it's in usually it's impractical because it takes uh, too much money in such games. But uh, this, of course, uh, makes uh, our prices seem high for a casual sim player. So in the end, our customers are um, avid fans of uh, World War II aircraft that want a complete experience with a map and the career mode and so on. Uh, not just a free plane with generic FM or a not a procedural sim where one aircraft costs as much as whole model, as you say. Moreover, we, uh, we try to offer uh, big discounts, like right now, B Battle on Stalingrad, the base game on Steam is 80 Five percent off, of, uh, so yeah. Usually, it's um, uh, usually it's uh, there is a good uh, opportunity for people to try the game for a little sum of money. So that's that's how it goes. I can just give a small addition to what Andre said. Is that I think that with those discounts, like for example, we have on Battle of Stalingrad right now we have a good opportunity to kind of broaden our audience and, uh, you know, expand our reach and trying to involve other people, uh, not only, you know, hardcore sim players into the loop because when they see, you know, a big discount, it is, I think it could be a good entry point uh, for uh, non-so-hardcore gamers as well. So looking back on it, um, it sounds like the, the, the plan was always to kind of orientate around a battle and, and to provide a full experience. So I would just be curious, like looking back on it now, are you guys happy with this, um, you know, with the initial decision to run with this or, or were there other pricing strategies you guys were, were thinking about, uh, like when the game was first starting or did you ever think of adjusting it like with the other with, with the other battles um, that came out later? Well, uh, we hope to be, we, we hope, yes, we'll be able to continue offering uh, this uh, like whole sets. Uh, but in the future, we might uh, like uh, tune it a bit. For example, in Rise of Light, our previous title, uh, almost all aircraft were uh, offered individually. And later on, we switched to this uh, pack uh, strategy. In the future, we'll try to continue offering... Uh, the packs as we do right now, but we might uh, just uh, adjust the amount of planes uh, in the pack. For example, for sure uh, there will still be a premium edition which contains uh, all the all the aircraft like like it's right now. But perhaps we we might. I'm not saying we will. And we might uh, reduce uh, the aircraft in the standard edition and offer the uh, uh, the missing aircraft uh, separately because. This might uh, this might help us to uh, somehow maybe just uh, reduce it be, uh, reduce the price a bit so it make it more affordable for for more uh, for larger audience. So the the amount of aircraft will stay the same, but uh, maybe in the standard edition they will be less and uh, they will be offered separately. So I um, I work in marketing. Um for for like a very large company and, and, and in my professional life we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, entry-level products where people come and, and find out about the brand and, and try out the brand for the first time and then they uh, the customer journey you know will start at a few select products and then the hope is that they eventually go to to uh, more hero products and, and become rec recurring uh, customers so I, I would be curious, um, does your team internally look at like what 
packs people start off with and then how they evolve like you know they may start off at battle of stalingrad and then do you track it like what do they purchase after like are you guys more interested i guess in, in collector planes um like, i'm just kind of curious on your thought on that oh sure we track uh, this info uh, obviously on steam uh, the most uh, popular pack is battle of stalingrad because it's a base game there and others are dlcs so you can't have a uh, greater battles experience on steam without stalingrad so it's like uh, the first place, obviously. Uh, other other models are going to uh, they uh, they are mostly equally popular, which is kind of surprising. But uh, yes, they are most almost equally popular. Uh, and uh, if we speak about the individually available collector planes, uh, the most popular ones uh, on Steam are P40, Spitfire Five, and P. 38. So, as we can see, it's uh, uh, Western-made planes, so it's no wonder they're popular. Wow, I'm actually really surprised to hear that. I thought uh, <laughs> I thought the 190A3 was going to be uh, one of the top three, so that's actually very surprising. I was not expecting well, that. Uh, uh, yes, um, um, as you said, uh, uh, 190A3 is also very popular, but... Um, it's because it uh, was included in the deluxe edition of Stalingrad, along with LA-5. Uh, we can't say that uh, many people bought it individually. That's why I omitted uh, it of course, uh, for, at first. Uh, okay. So, yeah, yes, it, it was also just a part of the pack. Yes, but it's, yes, about these two planes, since they were offered for the longest, longest time, as they started to be offered uh, with Stalingrad, they're also very popular. So uh, one thing I'm, I'm actually, I've always wanted to ask this question, and, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm really excited to hear this answer. So um, let's talk about points of sale. So players, I would assume the, the vast majority of them, uh, and I'm one of these players, just gets on Steam and, and discovers the game for the first time and, and buys most of the modules. But I believe Steam takes 30% uh, of the sales from um, um, from the developers uh, when things are purchased through Steam, and uh, me thinking that uh, I I've tried to adjust where I'm purchasing through the IL2 Great Battle Store. So, so that's what I think, and and the behavior that I've done in my in my um, in my purchase behavior. But I would be really interested in hearing about what's the relationship like with Steam and. Do you have a preference of uh, what point of sale that players use? Do you do you guys care if they go from from Steam to the IL2 Great Battle Store, or um, does it make no difference at all? Well, just like other companies, uh, we do get much more revenue from a sale on our website because uh, uh, there uh, the platform holder doesn't get its cut, uh, like the large chunk of revenue. On the other hand. Uh, the sheer now the sheer uh, size of the Steam audience means that many players uh, learned about our Steam there and prefer to make their purchases on Steam because uh, obviously people like to put uh, everything in one place. Uh, so uh, we have to we have to follow these uh, rules. So we offer uh, the game both on uh, our website and both on Steam to have the best of both worlds and of our products to at either place. So it's uh, like a win-win situation. We uh, get less uh, revenue per copy on Steam, obviously, but we'll get uh, many, many uh, customers there too. Right. So, so to summarize, um, to summarize, IL2 Great Battles wants to offer um, a unique experience that's centered around a battle it contains a map has all the relevant aircraft um, uses a pricing strategy that's uh, very competitive and tries to bring new players in uh, especially with the older packs like battle of stalingrad um, and uses multiple points of sales like steam where there's a large audience and the hope is that um, they don't just get one pack but they get the additional packs and then start to get the collector planes as well um, and, and then ideally that they, they buy through the IL2 Great Battle store. So there's more revenue realized uh, by the IL2 Great Battle team. Um, so great, you know, that's, that's super interesting. Um, 
what I would like to do is shift over into, into development, unless someone else has something else to add uh, about um, kind of the, the, the position of the game in the marketplace. Oh, uh, sure. Let's just switch to more interesting stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because yeah, development is much more interesting than, you know, talking digits and SKU, so... Yeah, no, I, I just... Um, I find the, the, the business side of it really interesting because I don't feel like it gets discussed much, but it, if you think about it, it does dictate a lot of, of, the, of the decisions. So I, I just like to have that context. But for development, um, a lot of things have happened the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of check in um, and, and for the players to hear about how, th- how things have changed and how it's affected the ILT Grave Battle team. So um, just for context, before we get into like COVID and, and like the geopolitical situation, uh, how, does your, how does a team internally think about uh, measuring productivity like, I don't know if you have an internal metric that you use. Is it like planes that are being made per month or packs per cycle? Um, but what was the what's the metric that you guys use and try to keep a pulse on? And then how was that metric hovering like typically before uh, before COVID? Oh, let me speak about it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, a metric is really simple. Uh, our only metric is uh, our ability to follow the development schedule we have planned uh, in the start of the project. So if we're following the schedule, then everyone in team is performing well. If not, then which means that someone uh, has done something wrong or something uh, have happened uh, which was unexpected uh, in the stage of uh, scheduling. So. Uh, from our hand, we never push our team to go faster than it's planned. And uh, if uh, something re- uh, is ready earlier than planned, uh, then we can use this uh, as uh, some kind of opportunity uh, to make something uh, interesting uh, for our community. Uh, but uh, if uh, developer is just going according to the schedule, uh, no claims can be said against against him. We, we don't use we, all this m- uh, modern stuff like KPI or something. We are um, not not so great capitalist here, capitalists here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, so project starts, there's a schedule, and, and, and basically everything is revolving around that schedule. And, and, and uh, productivity, I guess, is measured uh, how the, the timeline is being kept to the schedule. So what I would be curious to hear about is what did the um, you know, and trying to keep track with the schedule and hitting those timelines, how, how did it look like before COVID and then during peak COVID and then after COVID? Like, like how much did the, um, were you guys starting to miss the, uh, I guess the internal deadlines more often like during peak COVID? Cause I mean, everyone knows the whole world changed and everyone's productivity kind of shifted. So I just would be kind of curious now that we're in 2022, looking back on everything, like kind of just how did it all go at IL2 Great Battles like with the whole COVID thing? Uh, frankly, thankful to, uh, you know, luck, goodness, <laughs> uh, initial stage of uh, Battle of Normandy development and uh, stage of its scheduling uh, have been performed in times when COVID have not started. So uh, the part of development which requires most uh communication and interactions between um, uh, different developers have passed in uh, nor- normal circum- circumstances and covid have, have appeared in the mid in the middle of uh, development line and uh, actually our team have enough experience in remote working and uh, this was not super great trouble for us uh to continue the development as it was uh, scheduled uh, before but from our hand of course uh several team members have got heavy COVID. uh at, for, fortunately we all have survived thanks god uh but we have delayed uh, a couple months of delay uh for the project so with Battle of Normandy that is now released, congratulations, by the way, 
Um, Thank you. How, how much work has taken place already on the next great battle? And then uh, I would imagine that different teams must finish their work on Battle Normandy and then pivot toward the next great battle. So I would be really, I would like to understand what does the internal workflow look like between the different teams? Like I'm, I'm assuming that research goes first and then art and then coding, but um, I, you know, I'm guessing that work has already started with, uh, with the next great battle. So, you know, part of the team is working on finishing up Normandy and the other part of the team is working on the other side. Like, like kind of what does that look like? with the general flow in relation to the new great battle um so for next project uh, at the moment we are at the very beginning of the next uh, product development cycle uh but uh, some impressive results we already got them uh but anyway uh, the uh, full advance to our no new milestones uh, is not started yet. Now we are in the scheduling st stage. So principles are simple. First, we are collecting team experience from our uh, past project and expand them, expand them when scheduling new projects. This is a very simple idea. And the second principle is just trust our leads and trust to their estimates uh in most cases these uh, follow us to success uh from uh from formal point of view we are widely using grant diagram for scheduling uh and uh, we always trying to ar arrange tasks uh, by by the way which will allow us to make some kind of maneuver in kind uh, in kind of some deviations uh, in our schedule. So if uh, something if some developer have uh, got some kind of uh, flu or I don't know, and some tasks have delayed, you got to make scheduling uh, which we, which will have time buffers, uh, which which allow to make this case not critical. So, and the last principle, we are always updating our schedule uh, to have a clear vision, to have a clear vision uh, what is the current project status is every day. So that's all. To get more granu granular or more specific, I would, um, there was a Russian interview that took place, or an interview that took place with the Russian audience. Uh, that discuss potential next steps and uh, carriers in particular were discussed. And um, I think the language language that was used was that um, they're seen too too risky to do because uh, like a carrier based project would basically focus a lot on the carriers and, and they um, would take a significant amount of development to get right. So I was I was hoping you could clarify what does this mean for the Pacific? Is it totally off the table or, or would the team be willing to maybe try to grow into the Pacific while sidestepping carriers, like maybe a land-based uh, Pacific campaign? Uh, well, the Pacific is not totally off the table forever, of course. Uh, the Daniel in the Russian podcast has said that it's too risky for the very next project. Uh, we can tell, uh, and Daniel, I think you already mentioned it, that we have discussed and argued about the pros and, the pros and cons of many potential theaters, including the Salomons and other Pacific uh, theaters, uh, Pacific battles, I mean. Uh, we, we hope to tell about uh, this process of how we selected uh, the next project among uh, several others. Maybe in a dev blog or in some video in the near future. Maybe we go to in depth and tell why we have not selected many of the potential candidates. Okay, so so it's uh, it's risky, but it's not totally off the table. It just um, you basically just need to prepare more or not prepare more, but um, it just it just will take time. But it, it, it that door may open at some point, right? All right, uh, this door might open, may open in the future, right? And uh, what are sort of the like major roadblocks that you see that exist in the engine? Like when it comes to working with the current engine and the current limitations versus building out a new engine, can you describe your thought process and how you do that calculation? Like at what point does it become worth it to build a new engine? Or is that something that's completely off the table and not even like a consideration? 
Oh, you you're touching uh, very deep points, yeah. <laughs> so, what could I say? Developing your engine uh, in a uh, in a way it was initially designed for is a way to have no roadblocks on its path, actually. So our engine can't be can't be used for interstellar flights uh, or for or for microbe microbes life modeling, you know. But it fits historical combat flight simulation as well as it's possible. So uh, engine which is designed well does not need replacement. It needs only uh, development and evolution. You can check uh, for Unreal Engine history, for instance, yeah? Uh, we are developing our engine uh, for 16 years already, and uh, it still uh, fits its requirements and it's still uh, competitive uh, in compared to our direct competitors, right? Uh, so, next generation of, peop of people may develop something brand new but it will be after us so for the moment and for the future we can foresee from now the development and evolution of our engine is the best way to stay competitive and to craft impressive results that's all so mm, okay so let me i want to make sure i understood that so what you're basically saying is um, what you need the engine to do, it's still ca it's still capable of doing, right? And um, and really, when when bigger needs are needed, then the question of the engine will come up. Is that kind of what you're saying? Um, no, I say that while we uh, while we developing combat flight simulation, uh, we do not need another engine than our one. Our one our one fits uh, this task the best way. Ah, uh, okay. It's also, just, I, I don't I don't say that uh, uh, we will use the same engine uh, after let's say five years, right? But it will be in our engine because we evolving our current engine. And if you compare what we have now in our engine and what we have had. Uh, 16 years ago in the start of Rise of Light, you may say that this is totally different differ, uh, game engines. But no, this is uh, just evolution of uh, that uh, old engine to the, its current state. So evolution is the key uh, uh, to success on our planet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Um... When you guys look back at um, like the development of the whole game across all the packs, what do you think has been the single most like largest step forward in terms of the game's development since kind of like the very beginning? And, like, like what do you guys are like? Like, what was like the big th like the one big thing that really pushed the game forward? So it's very hard to say. Uh, great battles are uh, in development for 10 years, and we have developed six projects already. Uh, and very, there are so many cool features and cool things we have developed, and it's very hard to say which one of them is the top. So maybe it's best we are supporting the genre, maybe it's uh, best. Uh, World War II combat plane physics modeling, or maybe it's state of art uh, sky visualization with accurate support of everything specific for air combat. Standing on front end uh, of the art direction for all these years, maybe, or maybe Unique pilot career with historically generated campaign game mode. Uh, I don't know. It's hard. It's really hard to select from uh, all these points. Uh, Let's say most important is always in the future and always has to be done. It's not in the past. So with um, 
with kind of keeping with the engine uh, discussion, I I know a common point that's come up a lot is the uh, the four engine bombers, and I, I would be curious to kind of just touch on this topic really quickly because uh, we talked about the Pacific a little bit, and the four engine bombers are has been something commonly perceived in the community that it's not possible with the current engine. And I was hoping to kind of like just this point could be clarified. Like, is it really an engine limita limitation or is it something where you guys think based on the data you have that there's just not enough interest in like four engine bombers and it's just a big project to do and it's just not the, the, the juice is not worth the squeeze, if you will. Kind of what's uh, what's what are your guys' thoughts on this? Oh, yeah, I can answer this question easily. Uh, no, we have no any engine limitation to make uh, four engine bombers or even uh, 16 engine bombers, right? <laughs> Not a trouble. Uh, but um, it would be one or two, uh, one or two airplane project. And we don't want to go into this kind of products, actually. We uh, want to uh, continue to produce uh, projects where uh, not only one plane presented, but uh, there's some kind of plane set which uh, sh gives our customers some kind of uh, variativity of what uh, he, he got uh, he got in his product. Uh, from our hand, single or two seater is the best way to give player the immersion that the player is uh, is in full control of a combat machine. He is piloting. This is another point of uh, view to his travel. And from your point of view, uh, we never told that we never will do uh, four engine bombers. Why not? <laughs> okay, so interesting. Okay, so it is possible. So, yeah, this whole time. Yeah. Yeah, this whole time everyone has been telling me that like, oh, it's an engine limitation. It's not possible. So I guess, um, well, I guess my next question, and this, this might be reaching a little too far, but like, you know, were there ever previous plans to actually make them? And you're like, actually, let's not do it. Or, um, you know, the great, the, the current great battle that was being worked on just didn't uh, need the four engine bombers, um, we'll, you know, or maybe there'll be future ones that will need them. I just kind of curious on your reaction on that. Uh, Andrew, can you respond, please? Uh, Enigma, please uh, clarify. What do you mean? Uh, uh, our reaction for the notion that we can't make uh, four engine bombers? Yeah, because it seems like the engine can support it. So, so that that's a that was a great clarification. But I just am curious. Like, do you ever think that it will uh, ever come in, into the game? Uh, yes, so they might come even in the next project. We haven't yet. Uh, uh, decided it, but uh, yeah, let me make this clear. Uh, the, as Daniel said, there is no engine limitation at all. There is no engine limitation on engines, uh, so to speak. So uh, the problem is different. Uh, just imagine uh, like uh, a big uh, bomber like B-17. How much internal parts, how much internal equipment, how much different stations. And uh, since we offer the all-in-one product, we have to make uh, to model them. So this is possible, of course. Uh, but the problem is, uh, at the time, and it will take so much time and resources, we can make uh, like nearly one whole uh, set of war with different fighters and two-seater planes in the time of making just one uh, heavy bomber. So this is uh, what uh, com comes into account here, and uh, and even uh, even when we make them, uh, uh, even if we make such a bomber, uh, it will it will not. Uh, I don't think it will uh, sell as uh, as well as uh, several different interesting uh, one or two seater aircraft. That's that's the point. Okay, that is very helpful to hear, and, and thank you. Um, I think this will be really interesting for kind of curious to hear everyone's reactions uh, once they hear this. So, so thank you. Um, I have one last question about development, and then uh, the next couple of questions are more um, they're they're kind of away from development. But um, with the and this, this is kind of a nice transition into multiplayer, also. So. 
with a lot of the multiplayer servers, there's also a generally a, a perception that a certain number of AI, especially moving AI, like ground AI moving around, um, really seems to uh, hold up some of the multiplayer servers. And, and, and it's normal in IL-2 Great Battles for a lot of the ground targets to be static and not moving. And I am curious if your team has thought about maybe potentially uh, allowing things to for AI for ground AI to move around uh, for multiplayer and not to lag the server. So something kind of more akin to IL-2 1946 where, you know, there was like a lot of ship formations and tank formations moving around on the ground um, and to kind of give the game more scale. So I just would be really interested to hear your guys' reaction to that question. Uh, so uh, make me more clear. You tell tell about uh, optimization of uh, ground AI to make uh, their quantity and multiplayer miss missions greater, right? Y yes, to, to make more quantity and also to have them uh, moving and, and to do more complicated things, um, you know, via scripting or, or waypoints or whatever in the editor. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually, actually, uh, our ground AI is uh, pretty optimized uh, already. Uh, and uh, optimize it's, it's even more uh, means that we will we will switch uh, from current situation when every AI unit use uh, full uh, physically based ballistics for its weapons and uh, physical principles of how we aiming their weapons uh, 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 from one hand we we have this now from our hand uh, we it's already very optimized and uh, to make it even faster uh we got to set aside all these physical based weapons for ground units uh and make something like uh, laser flex you know uh and i don't think that our community will be happy uh if such kind of ground object will uh, act against them in multiplayer missions. Uh, so, from our hand, uh, to be fair, the main uh, network performance consumption at the moment, not AI units, uh, not AI ground units, the main consumption uh, of network performance are airplanes. Uh, because airplanes are very complex uh, machines. They have many parts. They have so much animations. Uh, they have uh, different systems. All these parameters got to be transferred uh, via network. And this loading uh, network engine uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, when server have uh, 94... Uh, 80, 84 pl players uh, in it, and uh, all these players are fly flying on the combat planes. Uh, server is uh, almost totally loaded by these players, uh, airplanes, and uh, there is no room to s uh, increase uh, gr ground uh, gr ground war stem, right? So. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, server hosters uh, don't like to reduce number of players uh, uh, to, incre to increase uh, complexity of uh, ground combat. Uh, so, this what this is mean. This is mean that actually only way to increase a number of AI units in multiplayer mission is to optimize airplanes how airplanes using multiplayer because uh, ground units as i said before are pretty optimized already so this is uh, not the obvious expl explaining to your question but uh, it is as it is so only uh, continue of optimizing uh, uh, in airplanes how we using the network model uh, can increase uh, the complexity of ground combat. So, okay, so another stat that I've heard, and this is like another th common 
thing that I see come up a lot in the community is that there's a belief that 90% of the players only play single player. And I am curious if that's still true today. And I was also curious if you kind of wish that number was smaller and kind of your thoughts on the, on the multiplayer scene in general. Um, multiplayer makes a game for maybe 15% of our customers, not 10. Uh, and we do not wish to, we do not wish it to be smaller or greater. It is as it is. And we are constantly improving multiplayer. Actually, you can check for update logs during last couple of years and, uh, be sure about it. Uh, whereas many, many, many points of, uh, game world changes, uh, which improves multiplayer gaming. Uh, and, uh. Actually, the whole game engine is developed around the multiplayer paradigm. Our single player, our single player game mode, it's just actually it's just a cooperative game mode, where is only one player take a part. Uh, so uh, there is very very much dedication uh, in our workflow. To multiplayer okay, so you questions. actually answered a lot of questions that I had all. like all, all in one go there. So I um, kind of jumping ahead, but what sort of um, like are you expecting any? So yes, changes have happened to multiplayer, um, and, and you feel like you're, you're you've been supporting it throughout the years. Um, but I would be curious if there's any specific multiplayer changes that are coming down the road that you're thinking of, um, and. You, you know, like like, what are some things that you may be planning for multiplayer um, that, that that the public may not know about? And if you can't get into it, I, I understand. But I just I wanted to ask. No, no, no. I, um, oh, you asking what, what I'm curious is about is are there any multiplayer changes that are going to be happening in, in the future? Ah. Uh, mm-hmm. Um. Let's say. First of all, uh, we uh, don't stop. We never don't stop uh, our attempts to optimize multiplayer, uh, and we always continue to do this. This is this is the first point. Second, uh, it's uh, very hard to make uh, multiplayer in uh, combat aviation simulator, which uh, is historical game with historical parameters of all airplanes it's hard to make it game like because uh, you you are unable to make the main principle of the gaming the balance we may we developing our airplanes as we were in reality and we never turn up one plane and to- turn down another plane to make a balance between them in uh, multiplayer gaming. And without this, without this uh, gaming uh, actually is impossible. Be- gaming in in wi- in wider meaning, it's is is impossible because this is the main principle of the gaming. The balance is the main principle. So I think that in our genre is very hard to make something super popular in multiplayer game mode uh from other hand as i said before we continue to improve our uh network model and we continue to improve how we're using this uh multiplayer uh network model from uh different objects from how we use it in air, air, airplanes how we're using it in vehicles uh, to increase the quality uh, of the multiplayer missions and to increase uh, their complexity. So with these, um, I feel like we're getting we're answering a lot, and this is actually very interesting. So another one of these questions that I have, which I feel like is a, um, a perception in the community, is the relationship between IL2 Great Battles and, and the Team Fusion team that's working on Cliffs of Dover. And there seems to be a perception, and I actually think I believe this too, or I was told this, so I, I immediately believed it because <laughs> it's the internet and you believe everything on the internet. 
But um, the, the, the perception is that the IL-2 Great Battles team and the Team Fusion team are trying to not step on each other's toes. And, and what, that, what I mean by that is Team Fusion is doing Africa and, and Battle of Britain, and IL-2 Great Battles is focusing on late war Western Front and, and the Eastern Front. And I just, I was curious, like, is that really how you've aligned the two teams internally? Like, is that kind of like a, a wall or, or swim lanes that have been established? Well, it's not like a law or something, but uh, as you can imagine, it would be a questionable decision. If we, if we would announce a Battle of Britain when there is already one uh, supported by Team Fusion, or they announce it a Battle of Normandy, that would be kind of strange uh, decision from a business point of view. Not only because uh, we are allied with Team Fusion, but because the sim player base is not that huge anyway uh, to have uh, to go, to compete uh, artificially and to artificially divide uh, the player base am among uh, two or more similar products if it's possible to avoid that altogether. Do you think there's any chance for Team Fusion and the IL-2 Great Battles team to kind of join hands and work on a joint project? Uh, well, theoretically, it's a possibility, of course. Mm. But uh, since uh, the Cliffsodover engine, uh, Blitz engine, the update and support, it has significant uh, differences to our engine. Uh, so it's not like we can just uh, make uh, aircraft for Tobruk and or they, they could for Battle of Normandy. Uh, because the workflow is different and so on. Uh, so the work collaboration between us is still possible if it's deemed feasible. And that fits the scale, our schedule, uh, schedule of both teams. Uh, what, what I must say is that uh, the Team Fusion has done an impressive work over the years. Uh, they took uh, the basically POS and uh, turned it, uh, gradually turned it into, uh, more, uh, into a playable product, improving significantly improving visuals. Adding new, many new aircraft and all, and etc. And they started as enthusiasts, you know. So right now they become they became professionals, but they started as a, like modders. Now, I have a few questions here that are more like stretch questions, and this is really reaching into the future. But uh, I would be curious to talk about the next great battle just for a little bit. And I understand you haven't announced it yet, but I was curious if you could kind of talk about or maybe hint toward what time frame it's in uh, or, or like what continent it's on. I know there's a lot of theories in the community floating around. Some people think it's going to be Finland or Great Battle of Berlin. Some people are hoping for Pacific or even Korea. So I just would be kind of curious if you could kind of hint uh, or maybe confirm like a piece of it. Um, so what I can say here, first of all, we have already decided uh, what the next product will be. It was common team decision it's not uh, it was not dictated from someone we have decided this uh, on our common team meeting recently and now we know what we will do next uh, uh, but before any announcement we need to schedule it and uh, we need to be sure that we have obtained all resources to start the development and we of course we can't disclose such details uh, you ask for but uh, you can be sure that it still will be hardcore realistic combat flight simulator where still will be piston engine combat planes it uh, still will be based on a real historical conflict and uh, historicism basis uh, and of course, we again will push the limits of realism and quality even more forward. That's all. Okay, thank you. Um, so w you said it was a team decision, and, and I, I like to hear that. And I, I am. Could you give a little bit more clarity on um, kind of what went into the decision making? Like, you know, I'm guessing marketability, documentation, availability. 
um, you know, what works with the existing engine. And then maybe also like what you guys want to expand on the engine. So like, I would be kind of curious on like the, the, the internal calculation, if you will, that people went through as they were deciding on, um, or as a team was deciding on the next great battle. So it's easy to answer. So we have performed analysis of all possible variants of the next project setting. Uh, we have dropped setting, uh, setting uh, variants, which can't be done, uh, uh, and, uh, can be done uh, by some kind of, uh, resources, uh, or some kind of, uh, requirements, uh, issues. For instance, we can't do setting, uh, with, which is uh requires to rep uh, requires to create the map which is super urbanistic because uh when you in 2000 in 200 yeah in in times of uh old old Sturmavik, it's okay you don't need to uh, show the full, full uh, scenery of uh, the map. It's not. Uh, it's not important that not all towns are shown. It's not important that towns are very simple on this map because it's uh, twenty years ago and uh, requirements and expectations of customers not so high. But today, today uh, requirements are high, and today you can't show uh, to the public. You can't pro provide as a product the map which will looks like uh, like some kind of draft. So you got to select the setting uh, which will allow you to uh, reconstruct the landscape with maximum maximum realism and uh, with maximum visual quality. Um, also, uh, we have dropped variants uh where we in uh where we can't show something brand new to the world in the next project we want to show to the public something brand new we want a new step in our development history in the history of our, of our team uh and so after all this filtering right uh five variants have remained and uh, after that we have selected only one of these five which give us most real, re, uh, reliable way to the new height of our combat simula simulation we want we want to achieve them hmm yeah I... it'll be interesting to re i'm going to re-listen to this conversation <laughs> after the next great battles announced because I, I feel like you're dropping hints, but I'm trying to think in my head, and I and I know you can't confirm, so I'm gonna re-listen to re-listen to this um, after the next announcement, and then I'm gonna be like, oh, this is what he meant. So, so yeah, you you have my interest, and I'm and I am excited for the next what? great battle. Thank you. <laughs> um, I you know I I've always really liked Isle too, and I grew up playing 1946. And, and I um, I stopped playing flight simulators for a while, and then COVID happened, and um, I think actually on Steam I saw IL Two Great Battles, and I was like, "What's this?" And I, I didn't really hear about the game, um, but then with COVID I started playing again, and I totally just dove deep into it. I think like in the first, I think of me downloading the game, I think I have like a thousand hours on the Finnish server. Like within the first year, I just like was playing nonstop. So I really like the game, and um, I think it does strike a a good balance um, of like fidelity and uh, like fidelity with uh, keeping things fun. And um, it's been really awesome to see, even like my my time since since coming to the game with COVID to now, like how much has changed. And um, and the community, I think, is actually in an interesting it's developed in an interesting way because a lot of people came from il2 1946 as well or ace is high so i feel like there's a lot of sophistication uh within the community of like people playing world War two for like a really long time um, but the game is still accessible for for new players so i love the game i i play it a lot so um you know i'm i'm 
I was excited to have this conversation and I'm glad that a lot of these things that the community has thought about uh, or, or just kind of convinced themselves to be true that you guys were able to clarify. Um, I did want to hand the microphone over to you guys and, and see if there was anything that um, now that we've talked this over, if there's anything that you wanted to add uh, kind of to the to, to, to the end and, and uh, kind of share your thoughts or, or something that you would like to, to share to the community. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for your kind, of kind words. It's, uh, it's, uh, we are glad to hear that you also an avid player of, of our game. That's what we all aim for, to give players uh, a new experience they like. Uh, oh, uh, just a, uh, a question out of curiosity, do you play on a flat screen or in VR? Oh, uh, I play on flat screen, but thank you for reminding me. I did want to ask about VR because, um, not, not, to, not, to, not to steal the microphone back, but um, yeah, like one thing I actually, I actually wrote this down and I, and I, and I, I missed it going through my list. Um, I play on flat screen, but another community perception that's been seen is that like everyone thinks that IL2 Great Battles is like the definitive game for VR, for, for, for flight sims. Um, like IL2 1946 doesn't support it, DCS kind of, they have it, but um, it seems like it's, it's a little bit trickier for the VR users. So um, kind of like what's your guys' reaction to that? Like why... Why is it so? Like, is it just a huge focus of the team, or was it the timing of the game release relative to the VR hardware? I just am curious. Uh, well, uh, uh, there are, I think there are two things that helped us. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we were able to add VR at the time while uh, when it was uh, new and hype, hype technology. It still is, but we managed to bring it in the start, added to the game, I mean. Another thing is that uh, we always prioritized uh, game performance, as Daniel was saying, that our game is pretty well optimized, technically. So, uh, which is also very critical thing for VR. Uh, what I mean, when you are playing VR, uh, the good performance, the good number of FPS, is even more important than good visuals because if you have bad performance in VR, uh, you'll get no nausea, you'll get headaches, and so on. It so it won't be a pleasurable experience. Uh, and the fact that our game is uh, have good optimization help it us in this way. Uh, so for most people, it just worked out of the box. They they turned on VR mode, put on their HMDs, and uh, ha had a good experience. Of course, we were we were working a lot uh, on making this more seamless, but uh, the core technology, the core good performance was already there. Compared to some competi competitors, uh, um, in their uh, sims and their games, you need a monster machine to run VR, and uh, the Best results are still not guaranteed. It's like you say, like they say, uh, your mileage may, may vary. So there are two things that helped us. And uh, uh, I, well, I want to add that uh, you should try VR if you haven't, because it's really a game changer. Uh, many you may have, might have seen on the forums, on the internet, uh, that many people who play in VR uh, who playing L2 are saying that uh, they don't want to get back to flat screen after playing in VR. Of course, it's has its uh, not limitations, how to say it. It's like um, it's just a bit different because uh, if on flat screen uh, to check your six in the dogfight, you just need to move your mouse a bit or joystick or joystick head or something and do a quick glance in VR, <laughs> you really have to uh, turn your head. And uh, some older people complain that their head uh, can't turn that, that fast. So there are some other solutions and helpers. Never mind. But um, I, uh, just my like last uh, advice for people who are looking to try VR, especially now game, or well, even other games too, is uh, I don't think you need a very expensive HMD. For example, uh, the relatively inexpensive uh, formerly Oculus uh, HMD Quest 2 uh, would work just great and will 
give you the the all the experience uh, you want, and you could decide if you go to maybe go, uh, go for much uh, more expensive ones or not. Yeah, the VR thing. See, I play on a monitor, so. But everyone who has VR can't stop talking about it. Like literally every player that has VR is like, they're just like, it's a game changing experience. It's the future. Get VR, get VR. So, but I haven't done it yet. I'm actually, I don't want to say I'm scared to get it, but um, for having a YouTube channel, I know it's much harder to deal with VR to try, trying to edit things and make the camera stabilize. And, and I, I know that they're getting much better about that, but I've, I'm like, I don't even want to try it because I'm so... I'm like worried that I'll love it so much that I'll uh, <laughs> then it'll make making the videos much harder. But um, yeah, I mean the game does run really well, right? And I'm not surprised to hear that it runs really well with VR. I mean, like other games, um, I mean other games like you know there's constant optimization tricks that you have to do and and, and to get around things. But I mean like IL2 even when, like on my flat screen, I get I'm always getting 144 frames like. I don't think I've ever been under 144 frames in the game. It just like it just works, and it's just nice to be able to, uh, you know, buy a game and or a DLC or whatever, and like it just works out of the box, and there, there isn't too much, um, you know, magic that you have to do, um, or like editing config files or just whatever. So um, you know, hats off to you guys. And um, it would be interesting not to get hung up on the on the four engine bomber thing or like the. The scale of the game but it would be really cool to do multi-crew with vr with your friends like in a, in, a, in a b17 or something like i feel like that would be just to look inside the cabin and to see everyone else i feel like that would be that would be a pretty incredible experience i would imagine so uh, i hope you guys really do go down that route at some point um um so yeah yeah, you can start. I think you can start. Uh, you can try it right now. Actually, as you, as you say, it's right uh, that um, the biggest wow moment for people it's not uh, just uh, the feeling of flight in VR, but also when you you see an aircraft with a busy cockpit, you just you can lean to all the instruments. You can see them right there, right uh, in front of you. For example, you can uh, try. Uh, I don't know. Henkel Bomber uh, uh, in VR, which is part of Battle of Stalingrad or Battle of Moscow. It's uh, it has uh, a lot, tons of instruments and uh, gives good uh, sense of scale and so on. Yeah, no, it, it must be incredible. I mean, like like I said, everyone who has VR can't stop talking about it. So so I believe them. Um, okay, so now I'm, I'm going to give the mic back. So. Um, uh, Andre, I think I uh, thank you for reminding me about the VR because I remember we talked about that beforehand before we got uh, before I started recording. Um, but a anything else that you would like to add or uh, kind of bring up that you think that you would like to share to the to the English speaking audience of the game? Uh, what can I say? And looking back, uh, I see so many cool things we have done before. But looking forward, I see much more uh, interesting features and uh, interesting uh, projects. And our next project uh, will make you very excited about most of our future when you will get it, I hope. Uh, and uh, you will have brand new experience where so guys please stay tuned stay with us uh and thank you everyone for supporting our project uh anatoly anything you would like to share to the english speaking audience i don't think so it's just like i would you know just like to do a small addition to what uh daniel said is that we're already as he has mentioned in the conversation before uh it was a um you know pretty tough solution uh, in terms of selecting um the next setting but the team has has made it has made it has made its choice and uh, i guess that pretty soon we will be able to share it with the audience all over the world so once again yeah stay tuned and uh, keep an eye on the news from from our team okay well thank you so much uh i really appreciate your guys's time it was very interesting and I'm, I'm again i'm really happy that a lot of these 
things that the community just kind of um, convinced themselves of. And I was convinced too. So I'm glad we, we kind of cut through that and um, giving the visibility to kind of like how you guys are thinking about the, about the business itself and, and the development um, and, you know, your, your thoughts on, on multiplayer are, are really helpful. So uh, I'm, I'm excited for you guys. I'm excited for the players and, and for me because I, I like the game a lot. And um, yeah, I just want to thank you for your guys' time. And uh, I wish you guys really good luck uh, on the next project. And uh, I hope it's a, a massive success. Thank you thank very much. You. Thank you and hope to meet you again. Thank you.